Amen. So Colossians chapter 1, we're going to go through the book of Colossians in the next few weeks. Um, Colossians um, is a short book. It's only uh, four chapters, but we're probably going to take several weeks um, to get through it. You know, I was looking at Colossians and thinking about what, um, what book to go through next, and I actually can't believe that I haven't uh, done Colossians sooner, because Colossians is probably um, one of the best studies, or probably the best study on the person and work of Jesus Christ in the entire Bible. In the, in the book of Colossians. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through it in a kind of a no-stone, unturned study. As a matter of fact, tonight we're not even going to get through the introduction. So let me just uh, you know, show that um, to you this evening. But when you're reading your Bible, when you're reading your New Testament in January, don't forget that. Don't go into the, um, don't go into the greetings and just kind of blow through things in the Bible because, oh, this is just uh, Paul's greeting and you know, he, he says the same thing every time. There's always things in the Bible for you. So just remember that every verse in the Bible is important. So let's look at um, Colossians. We'll take several weeks to get through it, but let's start in Colossians chapter 1. Um, look at verse number 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timotheus our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace uh, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So Colossae is in, uh, if you would think about uh, modern-day Turkey, if you can think uh, about the Middle East, if you know you have Jerusalem and then you go up um, to, the north, uh, to the northwest, um, you would have Turkey. And then, of course, if you would cross um, the Aegean Sea, you would have Greece on the other side. Um, Colossae is in, um, it's kind of a, it's not really a coastal town, but it's kind of along the coast of modern-day Turkey. This is what would be called Asia um, when, you're when you're reading um, the New Testament. Um, but it just kind of goes to show you, if you think about the geography about it, um, you think about um, how much these guys traveled. You know, you think about how much these guys traveled, and they walked everywhere, and they were, they were traveling around to all these churches. They were sending others to churches. We're going to see here um, in a few minutes. They were receiving people from churches. And, you know, I mean, look, this is how communication took place. You know, there was no phones. You know, there was no phones. There was no other way to communicate other than basically letters and witnesses is the way that they communicated with each other and knew what was happening. I mean, you think about how easily we can communicate today. Um, don't take that for granted when you're reading the Bible. That's why there was so much traveling and going back and forth. But, you know, they were writing letters to each other. He was writing letters to churches. Paul here is writing a letter to the church at Colossae. But they also had witnesses as well. And I'm going to show you that here in a few verses. And ultimately, I'm going to show you tonight, the witness is better than a letter. The witness is better than a, than a letter. And, and, you know, Brother Trevor and I actually demonstrated this um, this week. But many times um, when I'm, you know, we're, 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 everybody's remote working now. So everybody's constantly, they're texting or we use uh, Teams Microsoft Teams, and we're doing all these chats constantly. But when you're talking about something really technical and you need to really get into detail, you know, many times I will say, um, well, I'm just going to call you. Oh, and Brother Trevor did that um, to me this week. I was talking about him, uh, to him about something that needs to be done on the church, and, you know, I was trying to explain to him, you know, this technical thing, and he just calls me because it's just, it's just easier um, at that point to just get on the phone and just talk with someone in real time. That's the difference that we see in the Bible between letters and witnesses right there, okay? Is, is that difference between texting somebody and, you know, actually calling them and just talking to them on the phone. But here in Bible times, this took traveling. This took traveling by foot. This took traveling by ship. You know, Paul was shipwrecked several times. Look at Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 3. Let's look at um, some of this um, communication. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we, what, is, what do you see here? Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints. So Paul is not only writing to these people, he's heard something about these people. Okay? He's heard from somebody about them. Don't miss that. Someone has told Paul and the people that he is with about this particular church in Colossae and the people in it. And he says, since we've heard of your faith, and of what? 
and of, you know, the disobedience that you have. No, he heard good things about this church. He heard of their faith and the love which they have to all their brothers and sisters. So these people in the church at Colossae, they are very good at, you know, loving their brothers and sisters in the church. Look at verse number five. More detail. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. So now the people at Colossae have heard something as well. Which is come unto you as it is into all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God and truth. So these people, they heard the gospel, and they became fruitful since the very day they heard the gospel. This is what Paul heard of this church. Look at verse 7. Now we get even more detail. As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant. Paul saying, he's mine, he belongs to me, he works with me, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. So this guy Epaphras came from Paul, and he ministered to this church at Colossae. Was he the one that gave them the gospel? Maybe, possibly, we don't know. Um, but he was their minister of Christ, so it's very possible that they heard the gospel through Epaphras. And then look at verse number 8. So Epaphras went to them in verse 7, and he taught them, he ministered to them, he was their evangelist, um, whatever you want to call it. And then in verse number 8, he came back and he declared unto us your love in the Spirit. So this is the witness right here. This is the witness in verse number 4 that Paul says, we heard of your faith. He heard it from this guy. He heard it from their minister that Paul sent to them. Paul sent him this guy. And he told them about the gospel. He told them about Paul. told them about all this doctrine. They became fruitful. They became very loving towards their brothers and sisters in Christ, towards the saints. That's anybody who's saved, by the way. Anybody who's ever been saved ever on planet Earth is a saint. And it doesn't matter, you know, you know, some priest or some whatever, it doesn't decide who's a saint. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ decides who's a saint. But this guy, Paul sent him this guy, one of his team members, and he went and he ministered to these people. He preached to them. They became profitable. They became fruitful. They became very loving. And then he reported back to Paul. And he reported back to Paul this witness of this church. Look at verse number 9. For this cause, look at that. For this cause, we also, since the day what? Since the day we heard it. Since the day we heard this witness of you, we do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Paul is praying for their growth. Paul is praying for their continued growth. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think that, first of all, Paul, did he have an easy life? Do you think when Epaphras comes back to Paul with this witness of the church in Colossae, do you think that Paul was encouraged or discouraged? So these people were very fruitful where they were. They were very loving where they were, but they also encouraged Paul. I mean, that's pretty valuable right there. That's fruit in itself. To take a man like Paul, who's probably, you know, a lot of his letters he literally wrote from prison, and they're, they're very encouraging towards him. But then he tells him, he's like, hey, listen to what Epaphras told you. And then Paul encourages them, keep going, go further, grow more. It shows, look, it shows, by the way, it's another thing, it shows, by the way, the fact that they had to send a guy, and then he came back, and then they had to send other people. And Paul, how many times did Paul write letters where he's like, you know, I'd like to come to you, but I'm going to send this guy. Yes, they had a lack of men. They had a lack of people. It wasn't like, hey, we're sending you a pastor and he's going to be there forever. They had a lack of people in the Bible, in the Bible times, just like we do today. It's no different. Look at verse number 10. That you might, so now Paul, he's, he's talking about he's just praying that these people would just grow and just continue. That you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. So Epaphras, he goes there, works for Paul, he visits this church, he reports back, he reports their commitment, he reports their love for the Holy Spirit, and Paul writes back and he says, great, keep growing, keep going. 
So tonight what I want to talk about, and we're only going to get to verse 10 tonight, but I want to talk about the importance of the witness of a church tonight. You know, this church had a very powerful witness that Epaphras brought back to Paul. And what I want to ask you tonight is, what would people say about our church? What kind of witness do we have in our church? You know, what would someone who visits here take away? Because guess what? They're taking something away. It's not, are they taking something away? It's, what are they taking away? Is the question. Every church has a witness. So look, I mean, first of all, let's look at this in two different aspects tonight. Let's look at this, you know, in the church, and let's look at this outside the church. What is our witness as a church inside the church? And then what is our witness outside the church? What would people say? You know, the follow-up team, I went through with the follow-up team, you know, I mean, we are going to go out there, we're going to tell people that we are different. We are different. We are a different church. And guess what? We are a different church. Somebody asked this soul winning today. What makes you different? And one of the biggest things that people will come, and if we look at inside the church, people will notice that there's a bunch of kids sitting in this church right now. That is the first thing that people will notice right away, especially Baptists. Especially Baptists. You forget how weird it is. You forget because you've been in a church, a family-integrated church, for so long, you forget that normal Baptist churches don't have kids in the church. They take the kids out. So first of all, we're family integrated. That is a huge deal for us. That's one of the things that really makes us different. And you say, well, it's, it's a good thing, and there's a lot of great benefits from it, from safety to all these different things. But guess what? It's very biblical. Turn to Nehemiah chapter 8. Turn to Nehemiah chapter 8. It's extremely biblical, and that's the reason that we do it, because everything that we do is because of the Bible. You know, I mean, we don't look at things and say, I think maybe we should do it this way because I feel like that might be a better idea. Everything that we do in this church is because the Bible says it that way. Look at Nehemiah chapter 8 and look at verse number 5. The Bible says, And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people. Underline that. For he was above all the people. Again. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered him. Amen, amen, lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Look at verse number 9. In Nehemiah, which is the, at, at Tershatha, and Ezra the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people said unto all the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God, mourn not nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Verse 11 says again, all the people. Verse 12 says again, all the people. Like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, close to ten times in these few verses, it says all the people. This is one of the reasons that we're a family integrated church. And then they use next, they use fathers of the people. You know, so now we know that all the people means the fathers, the mothers, and the children are there too. Look, all the children were there when they read the book of the law is what I'm trying to get you to understand. Go back to um, Deuteronomy chapter 31. You say, well, it doesn't specifically say children. Go, but go to Deuteronomy chapter 31. Deuteronomy chapter 31. Look at verse number 9. Deuteronomy 31, look at verse number 9. This is when Moses is about to die. Moses is about to die, and now Moses is giving advice to the people, and look at the very specific advice that he gives. And Moses, in verse number 9, Deuteronomy 31, verse number 9, is everyone there? And Moses wrote this law and delivered it unto the priests, the sons of Levi, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and unto all the elders of Israel. Okay, that's the leaders, the elders. And Moses commanded them, saying, At the end of every seven years, in the solemnity of the year of release, in the feast of the tabernacles, when all Israel is come to appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose, thou shalt read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Then he says, gather the people together, men and women and children, and thy stranger that is within thy gates. Now why? Now look at this. Look at this and underline this in your Bible. That they may hear that they may learn and fear. 
the Lord your God and observe to do the words of this law. And that, again, he says, and that their children, which have not known anything, may what? May learn, may hear, and learn and fear. He specifically points out the children that they need to hear, that they need to learn, and they need to fear. In that order, by the way. And I'll explain that to you this evening. In that order. As long as you live in the land, whither, whither so you go to, over Jordan to possess it. So look, turn to Mark chapter 10. All this makes perfect sense. But the point I'm trying to get is you need to understand that there is a reason that we have kids and we are a family integrated church and the kids are sitting in the church service. It's so they can hear, they can learn, and they can fear. Right along with you. And it all makes perfect sense because if you look at what Jesus says in Mark chapter 10, look at what Jesus says in Mark chapter 10. Look at verse 13. You've just read this. The Bible says, And they brought young children to him that he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought him. So here, they brought children to Jesus. And the disciples were like, No, get the kids out of here. They're like, No, send the kids somewhere else. And his disciples, you know, Jesus said, he's, he saw it and he said, he was much displeased. And he said unto them, suffer the little children to come unto me. He says, allow them to come to me. Why? And forbid them not. Why? Because they're cute and because, you know, they're little kids and just be nice. No, for such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about you need to have just the, this, just this, you just need to break down your pride as an adult, and you need to just, just believe on Christ like a child would. But you know what that also says? A little child can be saved. That's what that means. He's saying, he's saying people need to be saved like a six or seven year old child. That's what he's saying. You know what that means, though? Little children can be saved. And little children will just. They will just, you know what they'll do? They'll hear, they will learn, and then they will fear, and they'll get saved. That, that's what will happen. Look, this is the main point of family integration right here. But look, if they're not paying attention, they're not going to hear anything. You know, I mean, I can tell when three-year-olds are listening to the sermon. Do you know that? You know, there's a reason, there's a reason that that I do things. I put things, I literally, I write things into sermons. You know that? I put things into sermons just to see if the kids are paying attention. I put jokes, I put jokes in the sermon. Because you know what God has done for us? It's really easy to make kids laugh. But the thing is, I put stuff into the sermon because, you know, I know who's listening. I know who's paying attention. But, you know, I can also tell when kids are sleepy. I can also tell when parents are sleepy. When you're nodding off in church, I know everyone that's nodding off in church. It's very easy to see from this perspective. But the, the point is, if, if church was nap time, what is the point of a family integrated church? That's the point. I mean, otherwise, we would just have a nap room. We would just have, you know, a Sunday school. Okay, I can see you're not going to take me seriously. But, I mean, it worked. Did it not work? Four dollars. The point I'm trying to make is, look, your kids need to be hearing the Bible. Your kids need to be hearing so they can do what? They can learn and then they can fear. That is what Moses was getting at. And guess what? If somebody comes in here and sees that we're a family integrated church, but, you know, it's just chaos and, you know, no one's listening anyway, look, it's a terrible witness. When I was a, when I was a Lutheran and our kids and, and Garrett was really small, we were Lutherans. We'd go to a Lutheran church. And in Lutheran church, you would sit down in the pew and then you would stand up. And when you stood up, you could see whatever was going on in the pew in front of you. 
and I couldn't stand it when some other kid and some other family in front of me, they just had all these toys and trucks and Cheerios everywhere in the pew in front of them because there was literally nothing I could do about that. You know, and I'm trying to, you know, teach my kids to sit in church, and they're in trouble. I mean, they're in trouble. They're, they're getting spanked if they speak up in church, and they don't listen in church, and they don't participate, and they don't sing, and all these things. My, my kids were, like, corporately punished all the time for that. And then they have to stand there and watch this kid play with his trucks the whole service. You know, it was, but you know what? It spoke to the church. It was a witness of the church. It was a witness of the culture of the church. The point is, all that to say this, it was a Lutheran church, it was wicked, the whole thing was bad anyway. We all know that. But the point is this, by the time your kids are three, four years old, they should be able to sit in church. They should be able to sit in church. Because there, here's the transition right here, folks. The transition is the mother baby room to sit in church, to hear, to learn, to fear. That's the path right there. And the thing is, I get it. It's hard. It's hard to do. It's hard. Look, if it was easy, everybody would do it. It's hard. But here's one thing that I know is a problem with some people in this church. Okay? Routine. And I think that we are, we are, we are not understanding the importance of routine in the lives of raising children. Children need, and, and I've said this for years, but homeschoolers themselves have a problem in this area. Homeschoolers, if you're homeschooling your kids, you need to listen right now. Because guess what? They, homeschoolers need to get better at this. Because we are supposed to take the things that the public school is doing, and we're supposed to do all those things better. But this is one thing, in my opinion, that a lot of homeschoolers are not doing as well as the public school is. Because you know what the public school is really good at? Routine. The public school is really good at, you know what, school, it's at the same time, and it's at the same place every day. You know, I mean, they're standing in lines at the same time in the same place every day at the public school. Right. Lunch, same time, same place every day at the school. Look, routine is, is super important. You know what? It starts as babies. It starts with the babies. I still remember my wife and I were talking about this just yesterday. When the kids were babies, I would literally have to hold her in bed. Because I said, no, the baby, the babies are going to bed, and our kids would never sleep with us, by the way, ever. And that was my rule, because, you know, the, the mom would probably have all her babies sleeping with them all the time, because, you know, they're moms. This is why you need two parents. I would hold my wife in bed. You make sure the baby's fed, you make sure the baby's changed, and whatever time we decide the bedtime is, you shut the door and you let them cry. And my wife, oh. But I'm stronger than she is. They must sleep in their beds. Why? Because they have to go to bed at the same time, the same place, every day. This is why vacations were so terrible for us. I don't know if we, I used to always joke, we just got to spank the vacation out of them. Every time we would come back from vacation, when our kids were small, you just have to spank the vacation out of your kids. Why? Because it's just everything was just thrown up in the air. The routine was gone. That's why. This is the importance of routine. Routine is a huge deal. They got to go to sleep at the same time, same place, every day. They got to wake up, same time, same place, every day. They got to eat, school, same time, same place, every day. Food, same time, same place, every day. This is routine. Breaks, same time, same place, every day. That's how you have to do it. This is, a, this is like a commonly understood thing, by the way. There, there is not any parental philosophy that you could find out there that would disagree with how important routine is for children growing up. Study after study after study will tell you that if you don't have a routine, you have no chance. No matter what your parental philosophy is, you have no chance if you don't have a routine. But look, these things don't happen on accident. They don't happen on accident. A solid routine creates secure children is what that will do. A child that won't obey, that throws fits all the time, you know what that is? That's an unsecure child that has no routine. And that is going to be a very difficult thing. So look, we're family integrated for a reason. 
We're family integrated for a reason. So these kids, they can, they can be stable in church, and they can hear, they can learn, and they can fear. But more importantly, this is what we're pitching to people. Think about it. Think about we're pitching this. You know, we're sending men and families to people's doors, and we're just pitching we're family integrated and all this, and here's why we're family integrated, and we're showing them these things. And look, there's a reason for it, and they need to see that reason working. So inside the church, this is the family integration inside the church is a powerful witness, okay, inside the church. The adults, look, the adults, we're also a witness inside this church. And, you know, we need to be friendly. And I'm going to say, we're pretty good at this. You all are very friendly people, the adults. You know, I mean, but we need to just be doubled down on this to make sure that we don't ever slip up on this. Because if somebody comes to visit this church and, you know, several people don't go up to them and introduce themselves and things like that. I mean, look, you got to be watching. Wait till the personal worker's done and then go in for the attack, right? And introduce yourself and pretend like you're friendly. But we're pretty good at this, I will say. But that's a great witness. That's a great witness. These people are leaving here and they're talking to people about our church. And they're saying something. I don't know what they're saying, but they're saying something to many people. So what's the other witness? We're witnesses outside this church as well. Go to Matthew chapter 5. Look at verse number 16. Actually, I'll just read for you Matthew 5. You go to Romans 10. The Bible says, let your light shine before men so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So look, we're out there and we're showing people that we're different. We're showing people that we're good. You know, we're good. We're, we're trying to glorify God by our actions here. What are the things that we're doing outside the church? Soul winning is the number one thing. Look, we're family integrated soul winning too. Look at Romans chapter 10. Look at Romans chapter 10. Again, look at verse 14. How then shall they call on him? This, is the, this right here, this is why your kids need to be out soul winning with you. Right here. You write this, you just put a bracket around these and say, why I need to take my kids soul winning. Verse 10 through 17. Look at the Bible. How then shall they call on him who they've not believed? Well, yeah, duh. You have to believe on Jesus. And how, they sh how shall they believe in him of who they have not what? Who they have not heard. How shall they hear without a preacher? Hear, hear, hear. 15, how shall they preach except they be sent? We are, look, we're sent. I'm sending you. We send ourselves except they be sent. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. Our feet are shod with the gospel. We're out there. We are sent and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? Verse 17 sums it up. It says, you say just, you just write on verse 17, why I need to take my kids soul winning. Verse 17, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You know what? You know what's going to happen? Um, parents with little kids, you know what's going to happen to your kids? Your kids are going to go out soul winning with you again and again and again, and then they're going to get to be a certain age. I don't know what that age is for your kids. Maybe it's five, six, seven years old. You know what they're going to do? They're going to start talking to you. You're going to go soul winning with your kids again and again and again for years. And then you're going to be out working on a lawnmower, and your kid's going to plop down next to you. And you know what, Dad, I was thinking? You know what, Dad, I was thinking? Um, am I going to go to heaven? That's what's going to happen. And then, you know what? It's, and this is, why, this is why you have, need to have the faith of a little child. Because then you just sit there and you explain, well, you know about Jesus, right? Well, yeah, Dad, I've heard you tell about Jesus like a thousand times. Well, son, do you believe, you know, those things about Jesus? And then you can just recap the things with him. And you know what? They will believe it like that. Why? Because they've heard. And they've heard. And they've heard. And they've heard. And they've heard. Why? They've heard in church. They've heard out soul winning with you. You know what? You're getting them in the spiritual fight too. You're getting them in the spiritual fight. How important is that, Joshua generation? You're getting them in the spiritual fight. And guess what? You know how you teach your kids? You can sit there and you can, you can bark at them and you can tell them, tell them, tell them, tell them. You teach your kids by showing them. That's how you teach your kids. Five-year-olds can recognize a hypocrite. Four-year-olds can recognize a hypocrite. But you're, 
you're that witness to them. And they're going to hear, and they're going to hear, and, and faith comes by that hearing. So your kids need to be out. That's, that's the first point out. So many. They need to be there. But the second thing is they need to be a witness. You're like, man, this is hard. It is hard. It's hard. But look, we're pitching this to people. We're pitching this to people. We're, you know, this is, when we knock on somebody's door, this is all they know of us. They don't know you. This is all they're ever going to know. They should see obedient children standing with their parents giving the gospel. That's what they should see. And look, you got to put the work in there. You got to put the work in. You know, I mean, these kids, they go out so with their parents, they're going to get saved sooner than most. That's, that's the first thing. There's big benefit in, in it for you and your children. But you know what? You're like, well, it's hard. It's hard to do. They don't, they don't behave. You know, guess what? Everybody's kids have misbehaved out soul winning. You know how many times we have spanked our kids out soul winning? I wish my kids were smaller so you could be seeing me do it. We have spanked our kids at the car. We have spanked them behind buildings. We have spanked them behind, you know, trees, whatever. It's not illegal to spank your kids. It is not against the law. People get so, you know, scared about that. But the, the, but the car's a block away. You take them there, you spank them, you come back. You know, maybe in cases where you're having problems with one of the kids, just do nothing but train them. Just watch them and then spank them. Walk with them and spank them. Go to the door with them and spank them. Just do nothing but wait to catch them and spank them. Th that's how you do it. But you know what that is? It, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of work. But you know what that also is? It's a routine. It's consistency. And this will create a secure, happy child that gets saved super early in his life or her life. This routine thing, folk, folks, I, I, I can't underestimate this because everyone has it figured out. Here's a, I, I went and I read up on this this week, on just the importance of routine in a child's life. And here's some things that everybody, I, I wrote down, like some people would have a list of 10 things and other people would have a list of 10, five things. Other people would have a list of 15 things. And I wrote down just a few things that everybody said that every study found, that everybody agreed on, just the things that routine will give your child. And I understand that this isn't the Bible, but look, people have observed this. You could call it science because it's been experimented and observed. Okay, look, here's some things. If, you're, if you have a routine, your children will feel safe, secure, and comfortable. That's, the, that's one that everybody agrees on. They will know what is happening now and what comes next. That makes sense, right? They will know why we're here, what we're doing, where we go after this. They're going to be completely comfortable and completely happy. And here's the super important one. This is secular stuff right here. But what have we been talking about? We've been talking about hearing. We've been talking about learning. And what does that lead to? That leads to fear. I'm talking fear of God. Good fear. The only good fear. But here's the last two. They will know how to do an activity or task. You know what that means? They will know what's expected of them. They will know how to do what you're asking them to do. Because it's the same thing every time. And they know the consequences when they get outside of that. They'll just know how to do it. And then the, the third one is super interesting. That This came up over and over and over again. But they will engage in learning. Well, I guess the Bible had it first. But the secular people, they even figure out things when they see what works and what doesn't. But that's why the Bible, that's why Moses said... They hear, they learn, and they fear. How are you going to teach them school if they can't learn, by the way? You see what I mean? This is super important that they have a routine at home. So look, look, folks, there's a method. There's a method to the madness. There's a method to the madness. And the last thing is, the last thing with kids out soul winning is that your kids... And the kids that go soul winning with their parents and they do it right and they're obedient and they listen and they're quiet and they, they, they know what's going on and they engage, they're engaging in learning. You're teaching them while you're doing it. Here's another thing about them. They will realize that it's not about them all the time. They will, they will realize that everything in my life is not just about me. Look, that's super important that your kids learn that. 
That's why you shouldn't just give your kids a bunch of toys in church or out soul winning or wherever. Because look, then you're telling them, yeah, yeah, I want you to do this, but it's all about you. Here. It's not about them. It's not about them. Look, out soul winning, it's about other people. And the kids need to learn that. You know, they need to learn that it's about other people. So kids need to be out soul winning with you because they, they're going to they're gonna hear out there. They're going to learn out there. And that's going to teach them to fear out there. And then there's all these just peripheral benefits. Like they're going to get saved. Like they're going to go to heaven. I mean, you know, they're going to get saved. They're going to they're gonna learn, you know, to not be selfish in their lives. But look, all these things, you know, it pours into the homeschool group. It pours into field trips. It pours into any outside activities that we have as a church. We're, gonna, we're renting out a, a facility here for the next, um, you know, few, I could see us doing this uh, every month, it looks like. I'm not going to give it away. But look, we're going to go to this facility as a church. And guess what? We're a witness there. We're a witness. Kids, when you go to this church, you're a witness. When you go to church activities and homeschool groups, you're a witness for the church. People should come out of that situation that work there or that do service there or give those tours, and they should, they should come to church here and they should say, you know what, I want kids like that. They should come out of this church and say, I want friends like that. I want a family like that. They should come out, they should come out, they should leave confused, being like, what in the world are those people doing different than everybody else? And they should be Maybe not confused, but curious and intrigued. Being just like, look at those results. But the, folks, it's not going to happen on accident. And, and just let me, let me encourage you because look, we have all been, you know, we have all been through this. Anybody who has raised small children has been through this. We have all... We have all had troubles with our kids out soul winning. We have all had troubles with our kids in church. We have all been embarrassed. I've been embarrassed so many times by my kids. I can't even tell you how many times. But it's hard work. It's hard work raising kids right. That's why people don't do it. That's why people don't do it. Because it's easier to put them in Sunday school. It's easier just to not take them soul winning. It's easier. But I got, I got news for you. I got news for you. It gets harder. It gets harder. You're like, what? I'm like, what? I thought I get through the three, four, five, six year old, and then it's easier. It gets harder. I'm going to show you why. <clears throat> if you can't get this right now, here's the thing. Right now, right now it's obey. That's what it is. With your two-year-old and your three-year-old and your one-year-old or, you know, one-and-a-half-year-old, your five-year-old, it's obey. Why? Obey. Because this stick, that's why. That's what it is. You're not dealing with their heart. You're dealing with, with, with their bottom. You're dealing with the fact they don't want a spanking. You're dealing with the fact that you, they just need to obey. Look, but if you can't get this right... Your leadership will not stand a chance. You know why? What, what are the three words that we were talking about? They need to hear, they need to learn, and they need to fear. You know, hearing and learning, you know what that takes? That just takes obedience. That's it. Fearing, now you have their heart involved. And in order to get to fear, you have to get through the other two. If you, can't get the, if you can't get through here and learn, you will never get their heart. And their heart will start to turn against these things. And then, it, look, it is super import, important that you get this right. It is super important because the heart is what you are after with your kids. You are after their heart. But first they need to hear and learn. And then they will fear. You don't want to be dealing with a 10-year-old who's got heart problems. An 11-year-old, an 8-year-old that's got heart problems. You say, when does the heart come in? How many news stories have you seen about kids that do terrible things at a young age like 8 or 9? You better figure it out. 
You better figure it out by that point because when that heart starts to turn, you're in trouble. Because they're not gonna, they're not gonna hear then. They're not gonna learn then. The heart is already turning because they didn't hear and they didn't learn. That's the problem. But guess what? They start listening in church. They start going out soul winning. They start just hearing the word of God, learning the word of God. Their heart will grow right. Their heart will grow right. And you know what? Because guess what? And people might disagree with this, but I don't spank my 12-year-old. When my daughter turned 12, we, I, I didn't, I, you know, we, don't, we don't spank our kids when they got to that age. I know some people do, and that's fine, whatever. But, you know, here's the thing. you got to have their heart at that point. Because you know what you do at that point? You start appealing to their heart. Yeah, they still do things wrong. But you appeal to their heart. Yes, there's still punishment. It's just not that punishment. There's still punishment. There's still reprisals. And there's still things like that. But you have a heart to deal with at that point. And you have a heart that you can appeal to. Because they heard. And they listened. And they fear. They're still kids. They still do dumb stuff. They're still teenagers. They still do things, but you can appeal to the heart. There's still punishment. Don't get me wrong. But you can appeal to the heart at that point. you got to have their heart, folks. You wonder why everybody's like, oh, 90% of kids are leaving church. It's because their heart's not there. It's because their heart was never there. And they grew up, and they're just like, forget this. There's all this stuff out here. What am I doing? Their heart's not there. So if you're having trouble, look, you got to have an action plan here. Parents. You guys got to have an action plan. You got to focus on these kids, and you got to focus on the areas that you're having trouble. You got to start micromanaging the areas where you're having trouble. Spend time only training. You got to attack this thing on purpose. You got to catch them doing what you don't want them doing, and you got to take care of it. Correct them, spank them, don't warn them. Quit the warnings. They don't have to obey. Quit the warnings, quit the reasoning. There's no reasoning. You do it. You obey. Or spanked. Look, the worst thing you could do. Look, like I said, we've all been embarrassed by our kids. All of us. The worst thing you could do is make excuses for them, though. Excuses will ruin your children. Excuses will ruin their children. And, and they're stupid anyway. Because if they're tired and they're hungry or whatever, it's all your fault anyway. Don't, look, don't make excuses for them. Just do, look, take the embarrassment. We've all been embarrassed. Our kids, I mean, Heidi and I, we were talking for the last two nights about all the things our kids have done to embarrass us. When they were smaller and like last week. I'm just kidding. My kid, poor kids. But look, you got to, you got to, you got to quit making excuses for them. You got to focus on these things and, and you got to correct going forward. Just, just forget about what they've done. Just correct it going forward. And here's the last thing. Here's the last thing. I'm going to talk about this a little bit on Sunday morning. But the last thing is this. If you need help, ask. I mean, what am I here for if not to help you? What is my wife here for if not to help you? And I'm going to talk about the difference between the advice of a brother and sister and the advice of a pastor on Sunday morning. And I'm going to talk to you. Look, I don't want to preach that sermon right now, but the advice that you will get from a brother and sister in Christ and the advice that you will get from a pastor could, could, could be the difference between you ruining your life or not. In my short time in the ministry, I've seen that. Sunday morning. We'll get to that one. But the point I'm trying to make, folks, is just if you need help, just ask. We're here to help you. We're here to help you, and, and, and we'll, we'll help you. People will know us by what they see on the streets and what they see visiting here. Family integration, it means the same thing as homeschooling. It means, it means more responsibility. It's, it's, it's harder. We have to be on a higher level here because of this. Just as Colossae had a witness to Paul, every single visitor that comes here will, you know, from whether it's from locally or from other churches, I, we will have a reputation as a church. I'm just telling you that right now. 
We probably already do. We will have a reputation as a church as people come here to visit and then they go back to wherever they came from, they will tell everybody about our church. And they will tell, like, you know, you know how long it takes to get a, a, a first impression of a church? Like, one time visiting. That's it. I, I like, I don't know if you guys know this about me, but I like order. I like, I like order. My first visit to Verity, when we visited in 2016, the first service, one time. I was just like, this guy runs a tight ship. Like, I think it was the first five minutes of, of the church service. Just seeing how everything was just organized and managed and run. Look, that doesn't happen on accident. I mean, that is not an accident. But the point I'm trying to make is just one time is all it takes. That impression, I literally moved there. That impression. People get the impression the first time. So, the family integrated church, it's a powerful witness. It, it's, it may be our most powerful thing that we have as far as a witness to people from the outside coming in. In the world that we live in right now, I'm telling you, in the world that we live in right now, with what other churches look like, with what other churches do, this may be the most powerful thing that they will see when they come here. And it's, it's, a, it's a huge selling point. It's a huge responsibility, though, because witness is a powerful thing. We need to administer it properly. And guess what? There's tons of benefit. <laughs> I mean, it's biblical. It's biblical, meaning it's going to work for you. It's going to work for you. But it would also make us a poor witness if we didn't do it right. So it's just, it's just one more example of, like, you just do things the Bible way and everything works out. You know, if we, didn't, if we said we were a family-integrated church... And then we just didn't administer that right, and we just let chaos happen here. And I just was like, whatever. I never want to have to preach a sermon like this. You know, I don't want to be a meanie head or whatever. You know, you know what that would mean? That would mean that this church is all talk, is what it would mean. And we're not. We're walking the walk here. It's a powerful witness what we have to give forward, and we will have some sort of reputation. So just remember that. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.